What's going on, guys? It's Eric Turner from Cover One, and we have another edition of the live podcast. Today, I'm joined by, joined by Nate Geary. Nate, what's going on, buddy? It's been a little while. Yeah, nothing much, man. Just uh, keeping on here. And basically, uh, well, today we've got, you know, some breaking news. So I guess this worked out pretty well for us today. Yeah, definitely, man. So the news is that Macklin Watch is over. Hmm. Uh, Bill's fans, uh, hopes and dreams of signing, uh, you know, a potential big free agent this late in the offseason. We're dashed today. The guy signed a, a two-year deal with the Ravens. So what's your uh, initial thoughts on that since it just broke a little while ago? Yeah, I mean, my initial thoughts are, I think I'm uh, yeah, I'm certainly disappointed at least a little bit. Uh, anytime you have the opportunity to add a player um, like Jeremy Macklin to your roster at, in June, um, you know, before mandatory mini camps really kind of get underway, and obviously you only have this one this week, Tuesday, Thursday, but, um, you know, in, in that aspect, I'm certainly at least a little disappointed they weren't able to um, you know, sort of improve their receiving core this late in the go of it. But at the same time, um, I think I'm really impressed with the conviction of uh, Sean McDermott, Brandon Bean, this Bill's front office. Um, this was sort of, for me anyways, their first real big test um, as to how they go out and conduct business. And, um, you know, if you've been a Bill's fan and you've been around for a while, you know that, um, you know, previous administrations were always comfortable overpaying for a guy. I mean, you know, look at Charles Clay, you know, two years ago, LaShawn McCoy. I mean, they paid LaShawn McCoy um, before they he even stepped foot in the field for the Bills. Um, and, and then you go out and you overpay for Charles Clay, and now he's got, you know, residual knee issues that he's dealing with and he may never be the player that they intended to sign in the first place. So, um, you know, this is a 30, 30 year old receiver essentially by the end of the season, um, whose skills, at least in my mind on film have been at least slightly diminished over the past few years. So to be honest here, if they value Jeremy Macklin at a figure, and that's the figure they told him they were willing to pay and they wouldn't budge off it. I'm extremely happy um, that they decided that they didn't need to overpay for a guy at a position they felt pretty comfortable with. Now, had they not drafted Zay Jones, I think this would have been a much more, um, you know, more pressure on them to sign him. But um, you've got Zay Jones, Andre Holmes is here. Um, you know, I, they've got flexibility. They could go out and get Eric Decker if they really wanted to. I don't think that they do. Um, but we'll see. I mean, the, this this isn't necessarily over, but um, I, I'm not going to lie to you. And, and Rob Quinn and I were talking about it earlier on Twitter about um, who was the receiver. Oh, uh, Robert Meacham. A right. couple years back, when he was a free agent, all the Bills, all Bills fans wanted him, and Bills Mafia wanted Robert Meacham so bad. Well, he was out of the league in two years. Now, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not, you know, suggesting that Jeremy Macklin's going to be out of the league in two years, but it's a very fragile ecosystem in the NFL. So um, I, I'm. I'm all right with everything that's happened. You know, I, I totally agree with you. Um, you know, they did put a value uh, on the the player. His his skills have diminished. He's not he doesn't have the same type of speed that uh, you know he once had. But you know, he definitely could help this offense. And uh, I'm showing a bunch of clips from you know some of the uh, plays last season and the way they used him. And you know, they used him a lot in the middle of the field. And I I thought that's where one of the main spots they would have. Uh, benefited from having Macklin. You know, they used him a lot in the middle of the field. They used him with Kelsey using a lot of high-low concepts to take advantage of the middle of the field, the short to intermediate area. Uh, but he, you can see on this play, he's still got a little speed deep. He's at the bottom of the screen here. Uh, and, you know, he does come down with a catch. It's like a 44-yard 40, catch. But, uh, you know, it, I don't know what the contract was in, in Baltimore, and I can't blame him for going to Baltimore. Uh, you know, Kansas City still used him. He still was a number one receiver. Let's not forget that his his skills are diminished, but he's a number one wide receiver. And that's what Baltimore needs. Uh, you know, they don't really have anyone to fill that role. And he will definitely benefit playing with Joe Flacco, especially down the field. Uh, you know, his his speed may his straight line speed may not be what it was, but he still can beat players. And a lot of times it's he usually beats them at the line of scrimmage. You know, his release at the line of scrimmage is is, is still top notch. And so if you can beat DBs at the line of scrimmage, uh, you know, that's definitely a skill that a lot of, you know, a veteran this late in the offseason, a team will take advantage of that. So it, it, he'll definitely benefit from, you know, going to Baltimore and playing with Flacco. Yeah, and the offense, too. I mean, from what they really do best, um, obviously the departure of Dennis Pitta, whose career at this point is likely over, um, 
what you had mentioned is his ability over the middle of the field. And, and I think they viewed him and they probably thought the same thing and thought, you know, we're losing a huge asset over the middle of the field to Dennis Pitta. Um, you know, how can we sort of supplement some of those, those plays, those receptions? Well, you get a guy who is very effective over the middle of the field, who isn't afraid to go over the middle of the field, which I think is important, um, especially for receiver Macklin size. He's not the biggest guy. He's also not very small either. He's sort of um, that tweener. Um, right. sort of receiver. Certainly still has that speed aspect to his game, but I think if he's going to be one of these receivers that has that elongated career, that that sort of step forward um, in the second portion of their career, the guys that come to mind, guys like Steve Smith um, and Quan Bolden, he's really going to have to turn his game into a more consistent um, you know, focus on pass catching and, and maybe not that burn or that speed part of his game, but rather the possession part of his game um, to really be the most effective in the NFL in the second portion of the back end of his career. Yeah, and the scheme that he that Macklin played in in Kansas City was obviously really good too. You know, Andy Reid and that staff do a great job of scheming to get guys open, and that's not something we've necessarily had in the last few years and honestly it's to to be seen if Dennison can even do that for that matter so um we were probably bringing him in purely based on his physical skills and that's something that i've you know harped over the last couple of years that you know, it's a great thing to have the percy harvins and whatnot guys that can separate based on speed or elusiveness mm -hmm. or suddenness uh but he would not be coming to buffalo to play in a, uh, the same type of system that andy reed is you know d developed over in Kansas City and Philadelphia. So um, you can see on the screen here. This is a you know courtesy of Pro Football Focus. Uh, but you know he had 20, 20 targets in the middle of the field with twelve catches. Uh, you know in the intermediate area, and that's what you saw. Like I watched, I think I want to say five or six games last year, and him and Kelsey were just eating up the middle of the field on these you know hitch uh, dig combos. Uh, you know if, if one was running uh, running a dig on one play. Um, and the hitch underneath, uh, you know, they switched it the next next series. So uh, Andy Reid did a good job like, of scheming to get Macklin his touches, even though you know he missed a bunch of games. And uh, so I, I do think that uh, it, it's it sucks that the Bills didn't get him, but honestly, I, I can't blame him. He he wants he's still a number one, and if he's going to play second fiddle to Sammy Watkins, um, it, I mean that's that's a lot to ask of a guy like him uh, who still believes in. Uh, you know, his, his career still, still has a chance and, you know, as he was he 29 years old. So to get a two year contract's not that bad. I mean, again, the, the details of the contract haven't been released, but I do think it's a, it's a good move on his part and you got to give credit to Ozzie Newsom to, you know, land the guy, um, this late in the off season. And from all accounts, uh, they may not be done from what I've read on Twitter, uh, from that, you know, the rap reports and the Schefters is that they, they may be going after Eric Decker as well. Yeah, and you know, here's and here's the thing too that I thought was interesting, and, and this sort of tells me a little bit more um, about that as well. Is as I think a lot of Macklin's success over the middle of the field certainly had a lot to do with Travis Kelsey, but I also think it had a lot to do with Tyree Kill on the outside. Um, you know, it really forced teams to spread out their coverage. It forced man teams to really focus their attention. When you have to focus on three guys and an effective running game, um, that makes not only your quarterback's job significantly easier, but it, it makes all the receivers' jobs easier because especially most teams know at this point, especially last year, that your focus needed to be on Travis Kelsey. If it wasn't, they'll beat you. And then if you don't focus your attention on Tyree Kill, he'll run past you. So that left to me, I, you would think then Macklin to have sort of a career year because there's two guys on that offense that require the attention of the defense. And instead, um, obviously injuries certainly played their part, but instead he had one of the worst statistical uh, you know, years stats-wise. Um, and, and that, at least to me, was a little concerning, um, knowing just how effective their offense was um, with those two other players I mentioned, that right. he wasn't able to really sort of explode. And, and this is a perfect example of the kind of plays that I think um, – he really is equipped for that. I don't even really know that the Bills are willing to run. They they haven't shown a willingness to run it in the past, but obviously a new regime could be a different story completely. But um, these sort of line of scrimmage throws have been throws and plays that really the Bills have avoided over the past few years. Yeah, and bringing David Cully over, my hopes and and is that they do start running these type of plays. You know, he was their wide receiver coach, and now he's coaching QBs, and so he could help Tyrod Taylor and help these receivers, you know, maybe with the location, the timing type of things. Um, you know, when I watch this offense, 
last year. Um, they almost seemed because I watch a lot of Nathan Peterman film. I'm going to tie him in here because I mean, Nate, we watched that that Peterman film. We broke him down together. You saw a right. lot of the similar concepts on these jet action sweeps and the short passes, the screen game, the short rollouts. Like the offense almost looked honestly quite identical, but the difference being is that uh, Kansas City used a shotgun a, a lot more than you know the University of Pittsburgh did. But uh, I saw a lot of the same type of concepts and boundary throws that I saw from Peterman College and from what Alex Smith uh, you know did with Kansas City last year. So I do, yeah. Macklin would have definitely helped in the screen game. I think that was there's no doubt about it that you know. But I mean, we've talked about this last year when. We evaluate Tyrod Taylor halfway through the year. Can he actually do that? You know, make those throws. Uh, we haven't really seen it. You know, it, it seems like an easy throw, but accuracy counts in those in, in those type of passes, those screen passes, right? Right. Yeah. And I can't help but to look at this play and immediately think, man, Patrick Mahomes is going to be <laughs> such a threat in this offense because it's such a unique offense in how they sort of disguise their route combinations. And in this case you have three, four players really breaking towards the sidelines, sort of stretching the defense when you've got your main target, Travis Kelsey, going over the middle of the field. And so it's such a unique sort of play because if you look here, you know, you can see each corner now is turned to the sidelines. You have this the corner down at the bottom of the screen with his hips turned to the sidelines and the other guy on the top of the screen completely turned. So yeah. now you've essentially turned this into a, you know, one high man under. Yep. And it just it, – it's – it's an exciting offense to watch, you know, and it's too bad that Alex Smith is so limited with his arm because um, it's just such a uniquely run, uniquely just game planned offense. But it's beautiful. no, I mean, in terms of the back, oh, it is. It really is. It's 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 one of those things where um, you know it, you can have a quarterback. I mean, I was even thinking like what Tyra Taylor could do in this offense. I, I think would be really scary too. Definitely. Um, I just think it's one of those kind of offense that that should really showcase a lot of its good receivers and a lot of its players, but obviously they're a little bit restricted with the quarterback play. Right, and you mentioned it, that single high look, and that's why I thought, you know, I was going to do a breakdown, obviously, of Macklin if we sign him, but uh, one of the things I noticed is, okay, you know, I showed a screen play, uh, uh, you know, a couple plays ago, and a screen play is almost an extension of your run game. So defenses have to defend it the same. So a lot of times the Chiefs would see these type of looks, these cover three type looks, you know, guys – uh, you know, how many guys are in the box or within, you know, seven to eight yards of line of scrimmage. So a lot of teams have to defend screen passes like the run. And that opens up these one on ones on the outside for Jeremy Macklin, the single high looks uh, deep. So uh, I thought that would have definitely helped, especially the way that teams have to defend Tyrod Taylor with, you know, the cover three concepts, the cover three match, which, um, you know, uh, the Tennessee Titans definitely run a lot of. So. Um, but uh yeah, it's 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 definitely uh uh kind of it sucks, man. It it really does because you know I want to give Tyrod Taylor his best chance uh, this year, you know, to to find out whether he's he's the guy or not. So having the more weapons you have, the better it would have been. Um, but uh, what are you gonna do, man? I, let's let's play. I make those make those other guys step up, you know, and and uh, you know. Uh, like Andre Holmes, the Philly Browns, you know, Zay Jones, get out there and improve your worth, man. You know, every, the number two spot's up for the take, and who's going to take it? Absolutely. And you mentioned Andre Holmes as a guy that I, I think maybe is sort of has been forgotten about since everybody wants to talk about Jeremy Macklin. Um, you know, I think he certainly has the ability um, to be a number two, number three receiver in the NFL, especially in this offense. Um, and at least so far with the personnel selections, um, it appears that size and athleticism really is what they're looking for. Um, so to me, you know, Macklin doesn't necessarily fit that mold, but I think they're certainly looking for speed guys as well. Um, and that would have definitely checked off, uh, uh, you know, checked off the box on that one for the speed. But no, I mean, you said it. I mean, of course you want to surround Tyrod Taylor in this year um, with all the weapons. You just, you just want to eliminate any excuse um, that you could make for yourself. It's not even for Tyrod to make excuses because Tyrod's not that kind of guy. He's not going to make excuses for poor play. He'll own it. But I think in terms of what the franchise does when they're going to evaluate Tyrod at the end of the season is, well, we didn't get him enough weapons, so now we need to get another weapon and give him another year. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just it needs to be sort of now or never um, opposed to kind of pushing this thing off another year, another year, because this has already been pushed off a year in theory. 
um, because, well, we don't know exactly what we have in them because we didn't have, you know, all of our receivers, things like that. So that, it, you're right. It, it would have been nice to put the best sort of squad around him, but I still think that the, the, um, the players in place now are certainly capable of, uh, of giving us a good look at what he has. Right. And they're going to get the, the, the quantity of targets that, um, you know, uh, uh, number two and three are, are, are supposed to get because we are, I mean, the run game's not going anywhere. So, uh, that, that had to play into Macklin's decision. So, uh, you know, and, and we're talking about receivers, but, uh, you know, we tie Tyrod Taylor's entrenched at number one right now. So who's your backup, Nate? It's a good question, Eric. Um, I spent at least a little bit of time over the past few days looking, um, Statistics-wise, a little bit of film here and there, um, and and we were talking about it a little bit earlier. Um, but I think this this is really sort of a um, a competition between Cardell Jones and T.J. Yates. Um, I think Nathan Peterman gets a red shirt this year. Um, I think he ends up likely being uh, the third quarterback that dresses or that's you know in street clothes. Um, and then you're really making a decision between Cardell Jones and T.J. Yates as your second string, and whoever doesn't out of the two is likely going to get cut. Um, having said that, um, certainly TJ Yates checks off a couple boxes you want. Your backup quarterback, a guy who's got playoff experience, which no other quarterback has on this roster right now, at least starting wise. Um, he has that anticipatory kind of game about himself where he's certainly not going to wow you with arm strength, um, certainly not going to wow you with great accuracy, but what he is going to do um, is throw to a spot. Um, and that's sort of how he's made himself into a quarterback in this league. Um, is by being a guy that can play in multiple offense because he throws with that anticipation. Um, having said that, though, um, he's certainly not going to wow you on the stat sheet. And like I mentioned, when you watch him on a film, there's nothing in there that would suggest um, that he's some sort of, um, you know, Jake DeLome in the waiting, you know, some guy that hasn't really had an opportunity that's just going to step in and become a starter right away. Um, I, I don't even really know that he's a guy that can come in and you can feel comfortable with him filling in for a game or two and get you a win. Um, and then, I mean, we, we, you can look through some of these stats from the 2011 season, um, which is what I try to focus on the most. It's his rookie season, his best season as a pro. Um, some underwhelming playoff numbers, um, to say the least. But, um, you know, you, you, this is what you're getting when you get a street free agent and a quarterback. So there's not a lot you can do about it. Yeah, and, you know, you, you sent over uh, some stats on him, and I, I just showed some on the screen. But um, yeah, I mean, his his rookie year was honestly it was brutal. Um, it, it, especially I, I think uh, what well, he started from uh, was it week ten, Nate? That he it was started? technically week twelve. Um, week 12. because I believe what happened was um that was the year that Matt Schaub was having a great season. Um, got injured in that week ten matchup, and what happened was they sort of had a carousel because obviously Yates was still a rookie. Um, they gave opportunities to Jake DeLome. They gave opportunities to Matt Leinart as well before TJ Yates finally took over and ultimately started the rest of the season. Right. Um, but, you know, it needs to be said, too, that this was a Houston Texans team um, that had 2,000 yards out of the backfield. They led the league in rushing um, with Arian Foster. That was the year Ben Tate almost had 1,000 yards rushing. Right. So um, nearly two 1,000-yard rushers on that team. Andre Johnson, um, a pretty darn good offensive line, and their defense has always been pretty good. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things where you kind of have to be careful when you're evaluating how good the team was based on who the quarterback was, because in this situation, they almost succeeded despite their quarterback, um, you know, if that makes sense. And I believe this is the – I'm not sure if this is a regular season game or is this the playoff game? This is the playoff game. So okay. uh, I, I only have a few clips from it, but they were – they got down pretty pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, by the second quarter, I think this is beginning of second quarter, and – I mean, they're already down 17 to three, I believe, and yeah. on, th on this drive. So, and when I tried watching some of this film, you know, quite quickly, I didn't really get a chance to break it down. I mean, he's a rookie, so you saw a lot of mirrored concepts. You saw a lot of deep shots like that, just just forcing the ball to Andre Johnson. Um, so, I mean, we have to keep that in context in this game. But uh, I mean, it, what it comes down to is. What do you want in your backup quarterback from a front office standpoint and from, from, you know, a coach's standpoint? Nate, what do you look for in a backup quarterback? I mean, I'm looking for leadership. I'm looking for readiness at all times. Um, I'm going to prepare as though he's the starter um, and, and knows that he's one play away from being in a game. 
Um, and that's, I'm going to tell you from experience, it's a very difficult mindset to have. And the one thing I worry about Cardell Jones is, is does he have that mental capacity um, to be the guy that's ready to play to, to, you know, every week prepare as though he is the starter, um, knowing that he's not, he may not see the field at all that day. Um, and that's a very difficult mindset to have. And once you get to the NFL, if you can't adapt that way, um, the league will chew you up and spit you out quicker than, I mean, you know, ask guys like Matt Leiner, for instance, you know, these guys who are um, career starters, they're, they're Heisman Trophy winners, they're whatever, they've always been the best. And uh, when you get to the NFL and, you know, you have to prepare as though you're going to be the starter, but you're not, you know, there's, there's certainly a, a complacency that sets in. Um, and, you know, I think at this point in his career, T.J. Yates is the kind of guy that, that realizes he's, this is Tyrod Taylor's team. He's not pushing for a starting spot. Um, so in that aspect, I'm comfortable. Right. Um, but what I would worry about, um, and, and also you have to realize too, he's going to have a very, uh, he's going to have a great familiarity with this offense. Um, you know, as you're seeing this offense now, this is a Gary Kubiak team. Um, this is a Gary Kubiak offense and you know, who's Gary Kubiak's right hand man. It's Rick Dennison. So, right. Uh, right. you know, this is, he's going to be familiar with the offense. Um, he's one. He, and, and I think too, when you look at back at the game before this, the division or the uh, wild card round against the Bengals, they actually won. This is a divisional round. And, right. Right. They beat the Bengals 31 to 10. He outdueled Andy Dalton. Um, I mean, in that game, he won 11 of 20 for 159 yards and a touchdown with a 97.7 passer rating. Now, on on paper, that's pretty darn good. Um, but he also had a 40 yard touchdown in that game. Take away that 40 yard touchdown, and he's 10 of 19 for 119 yards. So, um, and not great. Um, and he was certainly exposed in this game against the Ravens too. Um, you know, they basically. If you look on the stats, you'd say, well, T.J. Yates had a, had a better game throwing than Joe Flacco, but they didn't have to throw very much. Um, right, and, right. and in this game, he, I thought he was really exposed. Um, I mean, he went 17 of 35 for 184 yards um, and three interceptions, a 28.8 passer rating. Not good. Um, yeah. Now, certainly this team went on to the, um, you know, the AFC Championship game, would end up losing. But um, it's just one of those things you look at and you're like, what exactly do you have in this guy? Um, he's got the experience, but at the end of the day, how important is experience um, if he can perform on game day? So those are things you kind of really have to look at um, and sort of understand and dissect um, in what you want in your back quarterback. Yeah, I mean, and again, keep this in context. We, we don't believe he's a starter. We need this guy as a backup quarterback to come in and play, you know, and move the offense efficiently for, you know, a few games at, you know, four to six games at the most. So when he was, you know, thrown into this, uh, into this season, into the, in 2011, um, and and thrown into the playoffs, you know, and leading that offense, and he didn't, wasn't asked to do much. Um, I, I can understand why he struggled, uh, especially just for the player he was coming out of college. He wasn't, you know, a, a big time quarterback coming out of college. But for me, for a backup quarterback, you had mentioned a few things. You said, uh, you know, anticipation. Yes, he can do that. Um, does he have the arm strength? No, not necessarily. He's a guy that's going to work the short to intermediate area. All right. So as a backup, I think, though, Eric, too, I, I think it's important to note that, you know, when you have a backup quarterback and you are dumbing down your offense a bit, you know, you're, yeah. you're not going to be opening it up. You're not going to be throwing deep. So you want a guy that's going to be able to come in and sort of have that calming, steady effect, um, be able to hit these short passes. And I think that's what Yates brings over Cardell, where Cardell, I think you can't really dumb down your offense. You have to try to continue to maintain that same sort of pace. Um, and I'm not sure if that is something that, as a coach, um, do I want a guy who I think can, who thinks he can take over a game, or do I want a guy that's going to play within the system? And I think that's an important aspect of who you're going to choose as your backup quarterback. I don't know what Rick Dennison and Sean McDermott's mindset is. Um, do they think that Cardell Jones can come in and be the guy that can take over a game, at, even as a backup quarterback, or do they say, listen, we want a guy who's going to be more of a steady, common presence? And, and I think that's an important thing to note. It's about the mindset um, that this coaching staff has and what they want in their backup quarterback. Right, and that, and from a coach's standpoint, that is what you want from a quarterback. You know, you want your quarterback to at least care, you know, move the offense, right? And so I don't think Cardale is necessarily a good fit for this offense, first of all, and I don't think he has the mindset. He's a boomer bust player, you know, not, uh, not just in college, in the way his career developed, but on the field, man, he he's he's I mean, he's 12 gauge. He wants to push the ball down the field. His best plays in college were stretching the field deep. Um, that yeah, that's great to have as an offense, but we you saw how that got us the last few years. We've been a boomer bust offense 
um, you know, with that run game and, and the deep shots under Greg Roman and Anthony Lynn. Uh, so, but my main thing is, you see at the end of this game, they're down. Uh, he threw two picks already, all right? And as a quarterback, you got to be able to bounce back. You got to know when to take your chances. You got to know when um, to read uh, high to low or low to high, right? So, um, you know, I saw this at the end of this game, and, you know, he he didn't play well. You know, I, he threw, you know, two picks, and you're going to see the third one coming up here in a second to basically end the game. But he knew when he had to take a chance. You know, a few plays before, you saw on third and 12, he, he's, you know, playing against cover two, and he tries throwing it. Uh, to the the inside receiver down the middle of the field, and um, the, the you know the, the corner made a great play on it. And then here it is, the third one uh, by Ed Reed, and that one you know that one he shouldn't have taken. First down, you don't take that chance. You still got two timeouts, so uh, it is a mindset. It, it comes down to is the mindset, and that's what the front office and coaches want. And I just don't know if Cardell has that mindset to come into a game cold and uh, lead an offense efficiently. I just don't know if he's got that because, um, well, we haven't seen too much of him uh, at the NFL level. We saw him in the last week, um, last season. But and even that, when he prepared, uh, knowing that he was going to go in, he basically prepared as a starter, him and EJ did. And you saw a very uh, simple route tree. I mean, they were running simple combination routes, simple mirrored concepts. And so I just don't know if he's ready. Like personally coming out, I never thought that, Cardale would ever develop into a starter now whether he can develop into a backup I, I don't know if he's got that mindset because he's got a, he's got a big head man and he believes in his yeah. skills and that's what you want from a starter but from a, a mentality standpoint you that's your back you want you don't want that in your backup right yeah I think like a, a lot of what I talked about is, is sort of being that steady calming presence you know because a lot of times when your starting quarterback goes down there's sort of a um, a, an unsettling feeling amongst your team, um, you know, on the sidelines, you know, when your starter goes down, uh, there's that feeling of, oh, no, or, um, you know, we don't have a chance. And what you want your, your backup quarterback to come in to do is say, listen, you know, I've got this. I understand this offense in and out. I've prepared for this moment. Um, and, you know, it not be too big for them. And, and, and in Cardell's defense, too, I mean, he's never had a stage where, um, you know, the, the moment was too large for him. And I, and I think that's important for Cardinal too, is, um, you know, you talk about what he was thrust into as a backup quarterback. Um, he was a backup quarterback and he was one injury away. Um, he took advantage of that. Um, but, you know, as I spoke with you about it, as, as I am intending on going back into that season, it was, it was technically his junior year um, at Ohio State where he ultimately ended up losing his job to JT Barrett, who's still there. Um, but I'd really like an opportunity to look back to find out where the shortcomings were because um, a lot of it in my from just remembering was um, his inability to hit those timing routes, hit those shorts, to keep the chains moving. Um, as we talked about, always kind of going for that big play opposed to the safer play that's going to get you seven yards. Um, and when you're talking about a coach um, and what you want from your backup quarterback, you want the guy that's going to come in and be a little methodical because – um, what you have to realize is when your backup quarterback's in, you want to sort of give your defense and the ability um, to stay off the field. You know, you want to give your offense some opportunities to get some first downs. Maybe it's only one or two first downs and a punt, or it's one or two first downs and a field goal opportunity. I think that you need to have a quarterback with the mindset that a first down is okay, um, or a six yard gain through the air is okay, or a check down is okay. Right. And at this point, I don't know that that's what you have in Cardell quite yet. We, we could be wrong. He could have a great off season, um, but it's much more difficult to develop this stuff up here um, than it is, say, you know, refining mechanics with your arm or uh, with your feet. Those things can come in an off season. Um, study. You can study as much as you want, but. Um, if you don't know what you are looking for, it, to, to change the way that somebody plays is damn near impossible. It, it's just, it's instinct, the way you play, the way you carry yourself on the field, and your mindset. Um, those are things that are very difficult to redevelop, especially when we're talking about a quarterback who's already in the pros. We're talking about a 15-year-old, you know, that's one thing, but we're talking about a, you know, a grown man who's kind of set in his ways. So, you know, I, like, you, like you said that I agree with, too, I don't know that this offense necessarily fits his strengths um, you know, when I think of an offense that likely best fits his strengths, I think of the Arizona Cardinals, um, an air raid style offense um, that's going to let him stretch the field and use his arm strength. Um, this isn't that offense. This is a very calculated offense. It's a strategic one. 
um, that I don't think Cardell Jones is going to be able to pick up in one off season with his immaturity. And let's just, I don't, I don't mean to say that as a negative, he's young. Um, he's made mistakes. Um, and unfortunately, I think at this point, TJ Yates is almost going to be that de facto second stringer based on his knowledge of the offense and everything we've talked about. Yeah. You nailed it. He's, I mean, right now from all accounts, right. He's taking the number two snaps, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you're right. It's uh, he knows this offense. Um, and I think he's a better fit. He's executed it in, you know, obviously on the big stage in the playoffs. Uh, he's been in basically this offense his whole career, except maybe last year in Miami. Yeah, um, he had a, he had a stint in Atlanta where he was backing up Matt Ryan too. Um, yeah. Yeah, basically, you're right. I mean, he's basically been in this offense in some form um, for most of his career. So, right, and so I mean, uh, Cardell coming out. Uh, obviously, he was a, a big play guy. He, I mean, he he snatched. Uh, the big stage. He he did. He performed. I, I'm not going to take that away from him. And you talked about, you know, can he play from uh, the shoulders up? I mean, that has your quarterback, your number two quarterback has to be able to do that and do that off the bench. I mean, it, you're right. It's a mentality thing. But um, and I do think that's why Yates does have the upper hand. And uh, he's a good guy to have in, you know, everyone says in the film room, Aaron Quinn mentioned it in our chat. You know, he said it's good for Tyrod to have a vet to, you know, you know, to prep with and to, to know where those, his eyes should be on certain plays and certain routes. And so I don't think Cardell offers that obviously, cause he's still young. And if he was ever going to be a player in this league, he it coming out, it was going to be two or three years down the line. So I don't think he's mentally right. there. You talked about maturity. Um, I, I think that that's, you know, you, you talked about that. It's, it's above uh, above the shoulders and I don't think he's ready there uh, ready yet and but then what do you do okay so how many are you dressing how many quarterbacks are you dressing right. you know I mean you dressing two or three on, on game day Nate I mean I would go back to what they've done historically and that's dress two quarterbacks that's what most teams do they dress two quarterbacks with the third quarterback usually on the inactive list every week which makes me then believe do are they comfortable enough allowing a guy like Cardell Jones to slip through waivers with the idea that they bring him back for the practice squad, because that's to me the only way that Cardell Jones remains on this roster um, past this season. Um, it's if they release him to waivers, he clears waivers, and he's able to come through. Now, I personally, I have a feeling that if he's going through waivers, he's not going to make it through. Um, the, the and as I mentioned, I mentioned Arizona. I think that's a perfect, a perfect. I, I if I were the Bills, I'd truly be looking to explore a potential trade with Arizona. I think you might be able to get a sixth round pick back or a conditional pick back from Arizona. Um, they've proven to take shots on guys like him. I mean, Logan Thomas was that guy when he was got to college. Now he's obviously converted to tight end, but Bruce Arians loves those big, strong armed quarterbacks. Um, and they don't have a backup quarterback really over there in Arizona. Um, but you know, that's neither here nor there, but I, I guess ultimately my point is when I look at this team, there's no way that they're going to allow Nate Peterman to slip through waivers to try to attempt to put him on the practice squad. It's not happening. Um, they invested the fifth round pick in him. He is going to be the third quarterback. So that leaves you with what you're doing with Cardell, because if he can slip through waivers, that's ideal. Um, and then you still have development time with him remaining. Otherwise I have a very difficult time seeing a role um, on this team with just sheer numbers and unfortunately just what's in the room. Yeah. And the, the talk with Cardale prior to the draft, I, I thought, uh, one of the fits was Arizona. I think there was even chatter about that, the Arizona, maybe they want to, you know, send us a late round pick for Cardale because he does fit that vertical attack. And I mean, he doesn't have the accuracy of a Palmer, but he's got that size. He's got the arm of a Palmer where he'll stand tall in the pocket and deliver when, uh, you know, pressures in his face. So I do like that about Cardale, you know, it, but it just, I don't see him in this offense. You, you mentioned it. He doesn't really have the touch, um, in, in the short to intermediate area. And that's going to be, in, you know, extremely important this year. That's something that, um, all of the quarterbacks have to be able to do. Even Tyrod, it's still, you know, to be proven yet. I mean, he, does he right. have that short to intermediate passing game accuracy? to move, move the chains. I mean, that's the, the jury's still out on that. So I think Cardell was, uh, one of those picks last year that, um, uh, it was it kind of forced by the organization. They wanted to get some kind of quarterback. They wanted to get some kind of quarterback that fit the system. And that's what we were. We were a boomer bust offense the last two years in Greg Roman scheme. And, uh, weren't, we weren't one that, you know, weren't a team that liked to work the, uh, you know, the, the short area of the field in the middle. So, um, I, I don't know, man. I, I just don't see, I I'm with you. I, I think if you try to hide him or try to slip him 
slip him through, you know, waivers or whatnot. I, I think our team will take a chance on him. I, I mean, he could, he can be there's so. Just so there's not enough quarterbacks in the league, you know. Yeah. It just it, it's a numbers game, and um, you know, if this was a, a seventh receiver, that's one thing. But this is a um, a quarterback who I think is at least thought of highly highly enough around the league. Um, where you'd want to have a coach who's really good with quarterbacks. Even a team like Cleveland, um, a team that, you know, really has guys who are, you know, considered quote-unquote quarterback whisperers, you know, um, those are going to be the guys that uh, will have a keen eye on what this team does with Cardell. Right. And, you know, if say he were to go to a team like Arizona, if he's he's a good number three because, like I said, he was still a couple years away, it, to, you know, to three years away almost when mm -hmm. he came out. And so, yeah, let you know, let him be a number three. I don't think he's a backup. And I think we kind of uh, are on the same page when it comes to that and what we look for in a backup quarterback. So it'll be interesting to see because, you know, it, it, you never know, honestly. Well, maybe, uh, you know, Peterman picks up during camp and, uh, you know, Yates' contract isn't you know, excessive, they could honestly no. still, they could still cut him if they wanted to. Right. I mean, what's his contract at? Uh, Yates. Yeah. Oh, you know what here? I got it right now. Um, looks like, well, one year deal base salary, $775,000 and a cap number of 655,000. So I mean, he's likely not even going to appear on your cap because the cap is only, uh, takes you from the top 50 contracts of your team. Right. Um, he's likely not even showing up on the cap. So, and, and that's another thing too. I'm sure Cardell's probably making more. Uh, well, he might not be. He, I mean, he's a fifth round pick, but um, you know, that's certainly a number I feel comfortable with. I mean, he's got really no incentives or anything like that. So, right. um, I mean, a, a six hundred fifty five thousand dollar cap it is, you know, that's favorable. There's a lot. There's a lot of favorable things about Yates, and and like I said, a lot of it goes back to um, his experience in the offense. But I mean, his cap hit numbers are extremely, um, extremely easy for this team to kind of pick up. So. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I'm sure this won't be the last time we talk about it. So uh, I'll kind of wrap this up with a few questions that I got off of uh, um, our chat and uh, out of Reddit, uh, the Reddit sub. All right, so we have a question in regards to uh, who's going to handle the in-game adjustments on defense, Leslie Frazier or Sean McDermott? What are your thoughts on that? That's an interesting question. Obviously one that we're, we're just – it's a shot in the dark, honestly, because uh, we're not going to know this type of information. But what are your thoughts on that, Nate? My thoughts as Sean being a first-time head coach, um, that I think he's going to defer a lot to his coordinators. I mean, you're talking about Leslie Frazier, a guy who's got head coaching experience, a lot of defensive coordinating experience. Same on the other side where Rico's got a ton of experience, um, you know, coaching quarterbacks, coaching offenses in this league. I think especially in year one, um, there's not going to be that meddlesome or that uh, that meddling that you're going to get from Sean McDermott. I think he's really going to let his position coaches and his um, you know unit coaches do what they do. Um, and, and I think it'll be interesting. I think you'll know right away. Um, you know, I think you'll know pretty soon into the uh, into training camp just how hands on in the defense. He's certainly going to be, I believe, more involved defensively than he will offensively. It's just his nature. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, if it comes down to it, I think he's certainly, and that's the thing about Rex is Rex always sort of seemed to be in the clutch time or in, um, those, those moments where you need a big play. It was Rex out there, um, you know, barking out orders opposed to his defensive coordinator, Dennis Thurman or, 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 or Rob Ryan. It was, it was Rex. And I, I think when you're, when you have a successful sort of coaching tree and you have a successful um, you know, set of coaches that each guy is going to be responsible for their unit. And I think that Sean McDermott allows Leslie Frazier. I think he has a lot of respect for Frazier. I, I think that Leslie is going to have the final say. Yeah, there's no doubt that he's not going to be, uh, uh, you know, he's going to let his coordinators do their jobs. That's why he hired these guys. That's why he brought them on. That wealth of experience is going to, uh, you know, take effect in these games. And he's going to have to be worrying about a, a lot of other things, having not been a head coach before. But I, I'm with Aaron Quinn. He says it. the team's going to say it's a collaboration because it is. You know, yeah. these guys, you know, Frazier and McDermott run very similar defenses. And in the end, the X's and O's part of football, it, it, eventually they all, it all crosses. I, I mean, how do you stop a, a, a gap run? You know, there are certain ways to stop every play. And so when a team's attacking you a certain way, more times than not, both, both coaches are going to come up with the same, same, uh, you know, way to stop right. it. So, um, it, is, it will be a collaboration, but it, I, I do think that yeah, he's not going to be meddling in. He'll, he'll let his coordinators and coaches do their jobs. Uh, and it, cause that's the type of guy, coach he wants to be. That's the type of coach, you know, he's been brought up in, you know, that, that type of tree. So, uh, I, I don't think it'll be a big deal, honestly. 
And uh, so the other question that we got here, Nate, it was uh, from Tommy Velicki. He says, uh, curious to see our take on Clay and DeMarco's status as a possible threat out of the backfield or, you know, threat period, a second or third threat in Dennison's offense. Um, seems like we're paying uh, for versatility lately. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, how do you think Clay's going to bounce back this year? You know, he was, injury, he was on injury report every every week last year, basically. And uh, do you think this offense will get him the ball more and this scheme will get him the ball more? And um, I, I'll follow it up with a DeMarco question after you answer that. Yeah, I think what you can look for is a little bit more of what, uh, and, and I'm going to defer a little bit to the Atlanta Falcons here um, in uh, Kyle Shanahan's offense, where you saw a huge uptick in play action from Matt Ryan. And I think that had a lot to do with his success last year, is the uptick in play action. And what you saw a lot out of his tight end position and out of the fullback position are a lot of block delays. So you have a play action going to the left with your tight end on the right side of your formation who takes a down block originally and takes a you know, one count or a two count on that defensive end as sort of a chip um, to almost help out your, um, your right tackle in this situation because it's going to be more of a bootleg um, after that play action to the left where you have that uh, tight end, as I mentioned, kind of come down in that end um, for like a one or two count and then release out into the flat. And I think you'll see a lot of that from fullback and tight end, but just plays where you're going to get Charles Clay really into an open field situation and it's just a quick little, you know, dump two yard dump pass for Charles Clay. And I think when you've seen Clay at his best, it's when he's been able to create an open field because he is at one point, he came into the league as a fullback or as a running back. Yeah. Um, so he really is that sort of versatile guy that isn't just the go up and get it kind of tight end. He's the kind of guy that can make yards after catch. He's proven that. Um, so I think those are the type of plays you'll see a lot of to get him going early in ball games. You know, that play action to the left with a roll, a naked boot to the right with just a quick dump to him and allow him to fight for the corner. Um, that's what I think you'll see a lot of too. And, and, and maybe a lot of crossing or I think you might also see some more tight end um, screens as well. Just finding different ways to get Charles Clay the ball. Right. Okay. I'll start with the screen game. You're, you're right on with that. Uh, they do like to use their tight ends in, in, in a lot of screens. And that's something actually Greg Roman did pretty well himself. But I agree. Uh, um, you're right. Uh, Yak, uh, we need to get back to Yak with Charles Clay. He's going to be that short to intermediate guy, but. He's going to be the under route on these bootlegs. You have an under route, you have an over route, and then you have, you know, like a leak or a, a, a vertical stretch. You have an, uh, an over route and then you have the under route. I, I see clay being that under route, you know, whether mm -hmm. he's chipping and then, you know, getting to the flats or if he's coming across the middle on, uh, you know, twin sets uh, from the inline tight end position on the backside. Uh, wow. he, he's going to be that guy that they have to get it to him quickly so that he can do his thing with, you know, the ball in his hand. So that's the thing I think is the most important is, is getting that ball to him quickly, you know, and that's what that delay or that, um, that sort of chip block allows him to do is, is, you know, that defender is looking for the first motion, you know, whoever's covering him in a, in a scheme or whoever, whoever is supposed to be covering him is going to either see one thing is going to see his helmet pop up and he's going to see him go into a route or he's going to see him go into the line of scrimmage. Once he goes into that line of scrimmage, it starts to make that defender second guess. Is he going out for a route? Is this a run play? So those are the sort of things that help disguise, um, and but then ultimately can can help Charles Clay maybe get a little bit more involved. Right. And what about Demarco? What what type of role do you see him playing? I I mean I, I wrote an article uh, a few weeks back on on his role in this offense and whether he could jumpstart an offense. The fullback position in this offense, I can't stress enough, is extremely important. It helps the quarterback figure out coverages because they'll motion them out wide, and then they'll you know bring them in. And as we know, uh, motion tells you everything about a coverage. It, it really does, especially when it's a fullback because only certain players guard running backs out of the backfield. So it'll t immediately tell you pre-snap coverage, uh, you know, and helps the quarterback ID coverages. So uh, he'll help in that way. It help out of obviously out of the backfield. He didn't have too many catches last year, but he is capable of doing so. And if not, he's at the very least a threat and that, you know, a defense has or defender has to account for him at the very least. So uh, what else do you see from Patrick DeMarco this year? Think Bruce Miller. Yeah. That's really what I got to say about that is, is think about a guy. Um, and that was too, I remember talking to have a lengthy conversation about uh, to you about this is one of the more disappointing things about Greg Roman's offense was he showed and glimpsed so much pre-snap motion when he was with San Francisco. It was such a big part of their offense was allowing Colin Kaepernick to use that motion to do just what you said is, is sort of 
Um, see what the defense is trying to do. See how they're disguising coverages. Um, and the fullback is really the to you know, to use a cliche, he's really the quarterback of sort of moving the defensive round. So when you're moving him out and then back in, I think you could see a lot of what you saw in Bruce Miller as a guy that um, is going to be very effective out of the backfield, a guy that, um, you know, is going to catch the ball, who's going to do a lot of what I just mentioned Charles Clay doing, be that leak guy um, on a, you know, you have a vertical, you have a cross, and then you have a leak. Um, or a lot of those things are, you know, all flood to the short side of the field where you play action to the wide side and flood to the short side. It makes it for a very easy decision, a very easy throw for your quarterback. You're basically choosing between that middle linebacker. Who is he covering? Is he dropping back to take that crossing route of the tight end away, or is he coming up to take that fullback away? And you turn it into more of an option route or a run pass option. And I think these are it may not make you super versatile the fullback position. In fact, some people will argue that it sort of bogs down your offense because he's a bigger non-athletic player um, opposed to throwing a third receiver or a second tight end out there. But in this case, in this offense, um, I think it can really open up the thing um, that I would like most about this is giving Tyra Taylor maybe some more opportunities to run with the ball in open space. Yeah, I mean, you nailed it to a T. I mean, I really, there's really not much else to say uh, besides, you know, last season, early in the season, in preseason, actually, Greg Roman actually tried implementing a lot of the, these things with movement with the fullback. That's why they brought Gronk on. And if you if you look back at the Washington game, they mm -hmm. motioned Gronk out wide, moved him inside, they moved him around a lot. That was why they yeah, tried bringing him. No, you couldn't, and that's why they they actually tried forcing Felton out because they yeah. needed more movement. So mm -hmm. run, you know, this type of offense. So uh, it is something that I covered. You go on to cover1.net and check it out because uh, that Gronk article that I did last year, I took clips from um, Bruce Miller. And this is what we were talking about. I looked at uh, the 2012 season with Cap and Bruce Miller, and that's how they used Bruce Miller. And, you know, Roman did try to implement that last year. It just wasn't successful because he didn't, he couldn't. He couldn't run with Gronk. He, you know, Gronk yeah. wasn't the, the the lead blocker that Felton was. So Felton came back, and you know he was gangbusters from there on out. But um, with that, you know, we're gonna wrap it up here. Uh, Nate, where can we find you? What you got going on, man? I am at uh, at Nate Geary, WGR on Twitter. Um, I am on basically on a every other Saturday duty right now with Sale. Um, once the summer kicks off and training camp comes on. Um, I will be live at training camp every Saturday for the duration of training camp. So uh, you can catch me at WGR 550 on Saturdays from 11 to 2. And I also um, will be you know, making periodic uh, appearances during the week as well um, on WGR during the nightcap Ryan Gates' show. So that's where you can find me. And then, like I said, on Twitter at Nikiri WGR. Awesome, man. Well, you can find me at Cover One Bills on Twitter. Uh, you can find the Cover One Facebook page, Instagram at Cover One Bills. Uh, yeah, basically on all social media outlets uh, and definitely get to cover one.net. Um, you know, we got some good things going on there and, uh, you know, it's going to start ramping up once, uh, you know, we hit the mini camp and whatnot. So, uh, thanks for tuning in guys and, uh, we'll see you soon.